Hey everyone, this is three questions with Bob Curley. There we go. My first one in a while, Bob. I, we didn't talk about this, Bob, but I actually, um, I typically record podcasts. All I haven't done this in a while, so if I suck today, it's going to be all me, right? All right. Give me a heads up. <laughs> hey, so everyone, thanks for being here on the podcast. I actually have Bob Curley. He is the STEM director for Irvine Unified in California. That's that's Orange County, right? Yep, it certainly and I got, is. And Orange County, uh, my very good friend, Lainey Rao, I'm going to give her a little... <laughs> A shout out just in case she's listening and even if she didn't like the horn i know her kids love listening to the horn so i give this up so i'm actually um i'm joining irvine unified in february of 2024 and when bob and i first uh talked about uh me joining you all we talked about this podcast because it's a great way for you know irvine people um to learn maybe a little bit more about me but this is more going to be focused on you but also for me, just to kind of learn about you, kind of your hope and, you know, direction. And maybe I know it's going to sound weird. Maybe your people even learn a little bit more about you. Is that yeah. Fair? yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Because we sometimes we just don't know kind of the behind the scenes It's a little informal. And so uh, Bob is actually, uh, like I said, he is a STEM director, but he's had so many roles in education. He was a principal. You and I really connected when we started talking about principal stuff. I love yeah, we did. your principal um, and uh, also has taught. So he's done everything. Uh, he's did it for 35 plus years. And I asked him like, how long have you been doing this? And he did the trick where you have to figure out what year did I start move backwards from there. And there, there is like a moment in time in education where you have to count backwards, right? Yep. You can't keep track of it. It all starts to blur <laughs> together. It's just, yeah. You're like, okay, when did I start? What year is it? All right. So we're going to ask you, we're going to do the three questions podcast. So I know Bob, you, uh, you talk very glowingly about your staff. At Irvine, I know you've had a really amazing career. You were already before I like. I wish we would have. I'm gonna make sure I come back to it. Um, some of the, the uh, things you shared about your teachers, but when you think of a teacher who inspired you, whether it was someone who taught you as a kid, someone you worked with, who's a teacher that you think of that inspired you and why? Um, I would have to say Mr. Gentman, my sixth grade teacher. Um, he was uh, very even keeled, always positive. Um, good natured, uh, interacted with kids, uh, on a, on kind of an adult level. Mm -hmm. So I remember being in his class and not feeling like I was a little kid. He, he was talking up to us. And, um, I remember he was always accessible. Uh, if you wanted to find him at recess, lunch, before school, uh, he, he seemed to always just make time. And I don't think as a sixth grade kid that I was like, wow, Mr. Chapman inspires me. Um, I, I think it was much later uh, in my career when I really began to realize how much of an impact he had on me when when I started teaching and started working on my craft and I was thinking about what I was doing. I, I kept remembering Mr. Gentman and I was like, okay, well, what was it that made, I mean, I liked sixth grade. I liked going to school. It was fun. My friends were there. He made class fun. We were always active, but I remember asking myself, uh, well, what were the things he did that actually made it like that, that inspiring? And um, he, he really involved us in, um, in the ownership of what we were doing. Uh, I, I think if he were teaching today, a lot of people would say he was very involved in project-based learning. Um, but I, you know, back in the seventies, right. that's not what it was called. He was just making oh, us no. active and keep us engaged. And uh, Carl, my best friend and I, uh, we just had this idea hey, we want to create a school newspaper and print it up and send it out to every sixth grade kid. And he's like, sure, go ahead. And, and gave us full autonomy. And this was the 70s. So it was an old school newspaper. We would write uh, articles by hand on notebook paper. And then when it was kind of set and we knew what we wanted to say, we transcribe it to the carbon paper. And then we'd write it up to the office and put it in the ditto machine with the duplicating fluid and hand crank it. We had enough copies, oh, wow. hand collate it, staple it. But uh, I, I remember feeling like, hey, I can walk into the front office, me and Carl, and say, hey, we're here to make the newspaper. And the office ladies were like, all right, machines in the back. And we were like, grown up. I, I honestly feel That's like looking back on it, like I was an employee, like, hey, I worked at the school and this was my job and this is what I did. So um yeah, yeah, re really engaging. And we got to decide what the content of the newspaper was. So I think a lot of my writing in sixth grade was 
Monday, Tuesday, Carl and I would find out, hey, what's hot that sixth grade kids are interested in? <laughs> write an article, interview some kids, write about the sports from the week. We'd make a puzzle page, crossword, word finds, whatever. And then on Thursday afternoon or Friday morning, take it to Mr. Gentman. And uh, I remember once uh, Carl wrote an article that had a statement about a student that probably wasn't that favorable. And I think we, we knew uh, we probably shouldn't print right. that. And uh, he just, you know, would proofread it, be the editor. And I remember him again being really straightforward, direct, not condescending. And again, like I said, kind of treating us like adults. He's like, he just boxed it out in the carbon sheet, completely blocked down, said, sorry, can't print that. And that was the end of it. And there wasn't any talk down lecture. I mean, I think he was just like, hey, I'm holding standards. You know what right. they are. Don't try to push them. And I just always remember feeling like, wow, we, we, we're we sixth grade, but he's treating us like we're grownups. And and that. Uh, and that that really left a, a really good, strong impression on me. And um, I just found myself as a, a teacher and an administrator thinking, all right, how can I emulate, you know, what he did? And uh, he would he would come up often in my mind over the last 30 years and and uh, would would find ways to talk to kids in. Uh, mature ways, you know, make sure I wasn't talking down to them, treating them like respectful adults or respectful human beings and say, hey, what is it that you're thinking? What's going on? And and they don't need to, they don't need to feel like they're being uh, condescended against or anything like that. Yeah. All right. We got to give Mr. Jevin a, a little air horn. Absolutely. And that's probably, you know, being in California, you probably started TMZ, right? Like that was the, that was the, that <laughs> yeah. was TMZ. Uh, Carl went on to like, you know, Went on to lead TMZ and, you know, was, probably uh, that's, that's probably what I, I love that story. The, the, uh, there is one time I was actually, uh, I remember it was probably my first or second year of teaching and I was coaching high school basketball and I was in the, the gymnasium and one of my, uh, high school players, uh, was there. And, and so what one of the coaches was, and I remember actually kind of going at the coach and joking around and kind of mess with them. And then I was doing it with one of the players and, one of the, he said something to me i'll never forget he said you talk to everybody the same doesn't matter if it's a kid doesn't matter if it's adult like everybody kind of gets it from you i'm like yeah of course yeah like of course why would I, you know and i know like little kids there's a little difference than you know as you're kind of maturing and stuff like that too and it does make you feel really appreciated when it's not like you're talked down to like you're not just in that, that i remember i remember at that moment i didn't really get it but like as you're telling that story that really connected me and you know the the ownership you know you want to do better when you feel like you have an impact on the overall um you know vision of the school so what what a powerful story and it's uh it, it really also was a reminder that there's so many like we we pretend that everything good in education has happened like only when we started teaching and it's not yeah. true right there's yeah. like there's amazing teachers doing stuff i think that's one of the reasons i love doing this podcast is because it's like yeah someone else is doing that way before you so don't get too excited <laughs> so <laughs> i love that all right okay so i know you are an uh, administrator you work with some really great admin and you know you tech technically you're an administrator not a principal but it's still uh maybe a central office job, right? Um, so when you think of some of the best administrators you've ever worked with, I'm sure there's many, or maybe one that even has a kid, who's someone you think of and why? Um, my first principal was was visionary, Judy Cunningham. Uh, she hired me in my first job. And so there's a degree of appreciation for what she saw in me and, and the opportunity she gave me. But um, this was the late 80s and um, Caught in the Middle had just come out as a publication and there was a push to really uh, revision what middle school looks like based on the developmental needs of kids. You know, let's let's not take a high school setting and make it little for kids. Let's really, you know, take a look at what are the needs of adolescents and design a program around them. And uh, so she worked with a leadership team and pursued a state grant to totally uh, uh, revision what our school looks like. And it would work on the um, instructional pieces that we had in place for kids. Uh, we would look at the um, uh, physical structure and how we scheduled kids and, and how we could best meet their needs. And um, 
one of the things that I really appreciate about her is she had a really strong set of values. This is what I firmly believe in. And it was very student centered and very inclusive. She wanted teachers to be a part of it. She wanted uh, parents to be a part of it. And so when, when we started working, excuse me, she found a um, resource, um, the Coalition of Essential Schools that had 10 principles that really aligned well with what she wanted and uh, really shifted what education could look like. And I remember um, some of the key ones are, um, uh, you know, the students, the worker, uh, the teachers, the coach. Uh, let's put the student in the role of carrying the weight and let's get the teacher off the position of being hand presenting knowledge and you're just passively absorbing it all. Um, have a, to a, a tone of decency that permeates the school from staff to staff, kids to staff, kids to kids, parents, um, uh, all, all employees, and, and just really emphasize that. And um, um, having kids, all kids, demonstrate mastery of what they know. So let's not go through a checkoff list or like what we were talking about a little bit earlier and go through a standardized test where we can see, did you, can, can you pick out these things on a multiple choice or not? But no, we want kids to really demonstrate mastery of the content, the skills, the application piece. And so really move to performance-based assessment where we can really determine what, what do kids have. And and her passion to pursue that relentlessly uh, was was inspiring to me. And uh, I remember any time we were in a leadership team discussing some things, uh, she wanted to hear from everybody. It was very inclusive. She's like, "Hey, it's not it's not just me. I can't drive this on my own." But uh, what ideas do you have? Where do you go? And if somebody would bring up an outlandish idea instead of saying, "Well, we could never do that," it was always like, "Well, let's pick it apart." What are aspects of the idea that we can really integrate? What are some things that would need to change where we could implement that? And um, uh, she she cared deeply for kids and cared deeply for the staff that she worked with. And uh, very, very inspiring. I continue to work with her periodically on a nonprofit that she's working with that focuses on um, uh, supporting uh, adults that never got a high school diploma. And so still that heart of being able to help kids and adult kids now, but help people be able to move on in their, their life goals and, and, and what they want to achieve. Judy, Judy Cunningham, is that correct? Yep, certainly right. is. Give Judy a little, Judy's probably, Judy's probably listening to you, right? And that, there is a loyalty to the first principal that hired you, right? Like that, I love that. Cause yeah, there is. You know, that, that is uh, quite powerful. So you actually, you don't, I don't even know if you know this, uh, Allison Apsey and I, um, wrote a book called what makes a great principal. It should be out early in 2024. And you validated something in that story that was really important to us. So we actually talked about five pillars that are really important. And the first one we list is relationship builder and explicitly actually last or, um, listed visionary as the last one. And the reason we did that is because Sometimes we like, like we all, you know, as we go into schools, you know, administrators, they all have ideas of what they want to do, but you can't really build a vision without knowing who you serve and knowing what you have access to. And I think that can get you in a, if you, if you build the vision on your own, you're going to screw up the relationship. So it's like, Hey, these things are actually really important, um, before you start building that vision. So I, like when I was listening, it's like, Oh God, I wrote, I wrote, I feel validated. Cause we like that actually changed in the process of writing for us is mm -hmm. like, Hey, this actually shouldn't go here. It should go at the end. And, yeah. and I was, I, I should have talked to you. It would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> but anyways, all right. So last question, we know you've been in education, um, 35 plus years, you've had a ton of different roles, but if you can go back to that very first year of teaching and give yourself some advice, what would that be? My advice would be to really put the students in the center of critical thinking and problem solving. Um, when I first started teaching in the late 80s, there wasn't any internet. If kids needed to get information, the only access they really had was their textbooks, uh, an adult um, physically going to the library and accessing the information. But uh, in, in spite of those kind of dynamics, um, I, I found myself kicking myself about five years into the career of like, how come I didn't like 
put them at the center a little bit earlier. So I, I started teaching where the common pedagogy was. Teachers get up and share knowledge and you work with kids and you uh, have them do their work and you give them feedback and make sure that they've got competency and know it. But it was about uh, five years into teaching in a middle school science classroom when I realized, you know, I'm giving out these labs once a week and it's just a recipe. You right. give them the list of materials, all the steps, what data to collect, what to observe, what to look for. Then at the very end, we ask them to write a conclusion and there's only one right answer. Hey, because we led you through absolutely everything. Right. And I thought that that's not science and it's really low level thinking. Hmm. And so my my first step five years in, and, and again, I wish I had known it my first year and, and started to dig into that the first year, but I'm like, I'm taking off the list of materials. I'll let them read the lab and say, hey, what is it that I need? And if they realize they need to take measurements and one group lab group chooses a beaker and one chooses a cylinder and the cylinder gets better results, I'm like, hey, we got a good learning lesson here. What, what do you need to do in the way of accuracy and precision for, for your lab results? And, and, then I, and then from there, I just kind of kept developing it a little bit more of, um, uh, okay, well, let me give them the concept and let them create. What are the steps I'm going to need? And what are the tools I'm going to need? What materials will I need? And and I I, I think um, it, it just took me seven years to get there in the process of getting kids to really figure out how do I frame it where they're the ones that are doing the decision making, deciding what needs to be looked at, what questions need to be answered and how they're going to come about it instead of me being the one that's kind of spoon feeding everything. And um, I'm, I, I think with the advent of the internet and seeing that grow over uh, its development, kids have access to a lot of information now. And so it's a little bit easier, I think, in today's setting to kind of start there. Like, hey, we have all this information. What do we do with it? Um, but it, it's something I wish I had really uh, grounded in myself my my first year uh, teaching. Well, that that is like... It there is that like we have access to all the information in the world. So schools need to focus more on developing wisdom, right? Yeah. Uh, people know what to do with information. And you and I were talking about this before we got on the podcast. It's not that we shouldn't teach information. It's not that we shouldn't teach content, but what you do with the content then really does matter. Cause I think there's sometimes, well, you don't need to know dates. You don't need to know time. People's like, no, actually those things are, are good to know. Um, mm -hmm. but what you do with that information, that's, that's really, cause like I, we, everyone has access to the information. So how, you know, and not all information is good either. And we got to kind of be able to, that's why wisdom is so important. So I, I love this. I use so many great ideas, uh, in here. I'm really excited to not only, um, learn more from you in the next podcast, podcast, but you know, to see all this in action when I come to Irvine in uh, February. So thanks for being on the podcast, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, make sure you check out Bob will be on a future episode as well, but I really appreciate you being here and I look forward to, to learning more.